And we are back again this week. It's your host, London. I would know I was missing last week. Um, it's your master of moderation, uh, director of dialogue. I did it without saying the weird one. And uh, all around guy that likes to talk about cannabis and this fun stuff. We have our amazing group of panelists with today with our very special guest, uh, Dr. Michael Milburn. Uh, and we'll get rid of this little back tap and, and say hello to everybody. Where's the overlays? Apparently, I've been away for one week and I can't work the whole, whole unit. We, we're going to have a fun chat today and we're going to get into some really fun stuff. But before we do, uh, make sure to check out all the other fun stuff going on. We have a great show tomorrow with uh, Brian and Marco. Um, we dropped some um, post Spanibus content and, and all, of course, we have all the other stuff happening every single day throughout the week on the Dank Hour. We have some fun stuff. I, I think I'll be doing some announcements soon because we have some issues on the farm in this house. So will be some other stuff going on, but we have some amazing guests. So, Michael, why don't you introduce? Everybody knows everybody here, so except for you, you are a special guest. Uh, so, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself so everybody can get to know you a little bit, and then we'll get on today's subject. Uh, I, uh, in my career at, at teaching at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. Uh, I was a social psychologist, mainly studying uh, political psychology, uh, public opinion, mass media, political ideology. And after I retired, um, oh, and actually one of my main areas of expertise was research methods, measurement, and statistics. And that ended up being the perfect skill set um, to develop what I ended up calling the Druid app, um, which I'm happy to talk about at length. We will get into it. And, you know, I kind of, I wanted to, I'm a little bit worried because it, it, YouTube's funny um, and, and streaming's funny. And it was actually really hard to try and put together an image like today because it was like trying to search, like find somebody that's consuming and doing work on, on the job. And it's like the flag, red light, left and center. So it's, it is a very controversial subject. It's something that, that, that needs to be discussed, especially in places where we have legalization happening, where we have large medical programs happening. It's it's a huge challenge and we really need to to, to kind of get the air. And that's what we do here on the Dank Hour is trying to create some conversations that that create further conversations and hopefully develop develop it further. So well, welcome and and I look forward to jumping into it. You know, I, I um, unfortunately have been well, not unfortunately. I, I've gotten to consume, but not not a lot of not a lot of THC variety cannabis because here in 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 Italy it's, it's quite illegal uh, legal. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of CBD stuff so I've been we've been able to consume. But I have been um, let's say um, a moderate consumer for the past twenty-ish years little less than 20 years um and i you know I've, I've been wondering about this because it's it seems very interesting to get into but first uh can you break down a little bit what the druid app is um and kind of where where did that where did the concept come from and and, and how exactly do we understand what exactly is cognitive understanding of, of you know consumption sure sure um all right, so I originally called the app Druid. I was, you know, I had to come up with a with a name, uh, and it's it was originally an acronym for driving under the influence of drugs, um, and actually it it really came apart came about um, uh, maybe it was probably 10, 10, 12 years ago. Um, my friend uh, uh, Marshall uh, had just gotten a new volcano uh, vaporizer. And so I was uh, Friday Friday afternoons. We'd get together and watch Thor or some good movie and um, uh, partake. And I just I remember, you know, I was holding the cellophane bag and thinking, how would you compare how stoned you are now with how stoned you were last week? And that was the, as they say, the question that launched a thousand ships. Uh, and so started sort of think because I, as a as a quantitative social scientist you know questions like that open up a whole you know research agenda so uh we actually started collecting some data uh you know i had my friend marshall you know get stoned or and not not stoned and estimate the passage of 60 seconds um it was a little frustrating because he was actually better 
estimating time when he was stoned than when he wasn't stoned. Uh, but so, so I had some ideas. We played around with that, but I was still teaching you know, political psychology full time. So I sort of put that idea aside. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, I retired in 2015, and I thought I was just going to play my guitar and paint watercolors. Uh, and uh, then question four was on the legalization of adult use cannabis was on the ballot in Massachusetts for in 2016. And uh, the, the, the then Republican governor, Charlie Baker, the, the Democratic attorney general, Maura Healy, who's now the, the governor, uh, and Marty Walsh, the then uh, mayor of Boston, uh, all did an op-ed piece in the Globe saying, "Vote no on question four. It's really bad for you." And you know they they listed a bunch of arguments and evidence. And I thought it was one of the most dishonest op-ed and inaccurate op-ed pieces I re really can remember reading. And so I wrote um, a letter to the Globe explaining how they were, you know, kind of misinterpreting the results of some studies, cherry picking the results from other studies, uh, using rhetorical devices like, oh, the tax revenue it would produce was only a small fraction of the, of the overall budget, which was true, but irrelevant because most of the budget is already allocated for public health and safety. So this would be kind of free money. So I wrote a letter, uh, uh, you know, explaining the, the, uh, the problems with their op-ed and their arguments and the Globe published it along with a letter from Dr. Lester Grinspoon, whose name you may know. He wrote a, a classic book, uh, Marijuana Reconsidered, in the 1970s, um, where he reviewed the, the politics, the, the pharmacology, the chemistry, the history, everything about cannabis, and said there's no reason that this should be illegal. And he's, he was, at the time, uh, a professor in the uh, MD-PhD at the Harvard Medical School. And so... Uh, uh, I had it actually when I was in college, my senior year, when I took physiological psychology, I actually did my paper on cannabis and the effects of cannabis. And I put it in the context of a classic social psychology experiment. Um, and I had run across his book then. So I thought, oh, and it turned out he lived, he lives in our town or he, he did at the time he's passed away. He, he lived in our town. So I went over and had lunch with him. Uh, I wanted to find out how he got involved in in all this, and he had a great Carl Sagan story. Uh, and uh, he was just sort of getting up to leave. And and I said, oh, and I've thought of this way to measure impairment from cannabis. And he said, you should do that. You should do that. That's a major argument being used to oppose legalization, because uh, I'm very pro-legalization, uh, that there's no way to measure impairment from cannabis. You should do that. And I said, oh, OK, I guess I will. And it turned out I really underestimated how much I enjoyed doing research. You know, I was, I had started taking a graphic novel, you know, drawing and, and writing course and so on like that. Uh, but I, I really, turns out I really enjoy doing uh, research. Uh, and so uh, started doing, a, 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 you know, using myself as a subject. Oh, you know, and the great thing about the Druid app, you know, it uh, measures impairment from cannabis in just one minute. We have a three minute version and a one minute version. And it really allows basically anyone to be a ca cannabinoid scientist using themselves as a uh, research subject. Because you can uh, assess, because you know, reactions to cannabis can be so idiosyncratic that you know, what one person finds in terms of their effects of a particular strain or something may be different than what you experience and so on like that. So um, uh, I've really, uh, enjoyed using it as a, as a window in terms of my own ex experience. And uh, I've the last uh, number of years, I've been, um, uh, my level of consumption ended up, uh, my, my tolerance for cannabis has increased quite a bit in the last five years, I should say. So anyway, that's a, I, I can talk for hours about, by the way, so I should let We'll, we'll we'll have lots of questions and i'm sure there's some specific things that want to be jumped into now i want to i'm throwing damon to the wolves like right away because <laughs> i know he's excited to get in and, and talk oh, to, and probably has a couple oh i want to go first i know <laughs> but i went first already so you're always yeah, going to be second because I, I always have to go first uh but you know it 
there are so many questions that pop up. I'm just trying to render down my mind. I don't even know where to begin and whether he likes it. Yeah, that's the problem, right? Because it, it's a lot. So, like, what do we... Him. Go ahead, Ann. <laughs> Anna's got something first. He's okay. going. <laughs> so, um, this actually came from a friend of mine, but I, I'm interested, too. So it's an app, right? So you can test yep. it on yourself. Right. Right? And so you can, like... Test it on yourself to find out if you're too high to do X, Y, or Z. Um, so this is like you can take a baseline for what you are yourself when you're not, when you haven't consumed, and right. then test yourself after you've consumed, and the device will be able to tell you how high you are. Right? Is that right. kind of the deal? So then, right. Yeah. So then, if you don't like, if it was to be used as a like a roadside. Thing, how would that you do a baseline on that? Or oh well, um, <clears throat> I guess there that's are maybe far into the conversation, but I want to ask. <laughs> right, right. But well, so um, the whole uh, what my company, Im Impairment Science, is doing now is focusing on workplace safety testing, mm -hmm. um, fitness for duty. Um, and so we have a number of, of companies um, around the world at this point um, uh, using it. Um, the roadside testing for someone who, who's impaired is a more complicated question. And what I mean, I actually, when I first thought of this, I, I was really, it didn't occur to me that there are a lot of, you know, uh, power groups that have a have a say in this that the uh, the you know the the drug recognition expert program the dre program um uh the, they're potentially threatened by a tool like this um uh, uh so um it, it's going to be a, a number of years uh at least before druid could ever be used by the roadside because you know the politicians the courts you know, other scientists, everyone has to, it's a, you know, to, to get the 0.08 level of alcohol established, that was a, you know, 15, 20 year process, something like that. So I don't think this is going to happen, you know, really anytime soon. Um, uh, uh, but that being said, I have figured you, obviously, if someone is stopped by the roadside and they're impaired, the, the police officer is not going to be able to measure their baseline uh, you mm -hmm. know to be able able to compare uh, but we do have uh, but i have actually thought of various ways where druid can be used without a baseline we have you know tens of thousands of of scores so we know for people at any particular age um uh what the what the range of scores is and you know we know um so i should sort of say um the, the, it, you do the Druid app, you're measuring reaction time, hand-eye coordination, balance, um, and uh, in one to three minutes, you get a, a single score um, that is uh, generally ranges from about 30 to about 75. Higher number is higher impairment. Um, and, uh, baseline scores are kind of in the 30s, low 40s, uh, a score of 55 for anyone 50 years and, and younger is more impaired than 95% of the people of that age group. So we have normative data. Uh, and also, I mean, I realized, well, the, 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 the research is very clear that, that being stoned interferes with learning new information, makes it harder, doesn't prevent it, but but makes it harder. So what we found, and I should point this out as well, is that the first time someone does Druid, their score is often higher than their actual level of cognitive motor performance. Um, and that's because Druid is a tool. And any tool, uh, even one as simple as a hammer, needs to you need to practice with it to use it most effectively. And Druid is, is no different. But we find uh, our, our data show that people tend to stabilize a baseline um, uh, uh, within about three to five times doing Druid. Uh, so it, it doesn't take long, but, uh, but, but people's, you know, they, if, they're, if they're real, you know, baseline is 40, 
and the first time they do it, they might get a 45 or a 48. Uh, but then they learn the rules of the of the video tasks because um, it's basically just like a, a video game. Uh, the rules are pretty simple, and people's scores go down. Um, uh, you know, reaching what the usually the sort of appropriate level is. Uh, I think, and we need to collect data on this, but I'm pretty sure this is going to be the case that someone who has never done Druid is really impaired. And I, actually, we, we have, we did some research with um, uh, uh, police academy um, uh, wet labs, where these, uh, the, the DRE programs uh, bring in, or, or the, the cadets bring in volunteers who drink alcohol um, to get their uh, blood alcohol concentration up to uh, 0.08 or, or more, you know, 0.11, and then the cadets can sort of practice doing the standard field sobriety test on actual drunk people. Um, and they let me uh, give give all their volunteers, uh, they all did Druid before they started drinking, and then they did Druid uh, throughout a few hours as they were getting their BAC up. And uh, we found that the um, a score of 55 is about the equ equivalent impairment for someone with a with a 0 0.08 um, BAC level. Um, and so let's say someone. Oh, oh, say let me see. Um, I digressed and and lost my train of thought there. Um, so is. So it's, a, it's measuring your level of impairment. Could you take the test under the oh, oh, anything? Uh, yes, but actually the point I was, I was going to make is I don't think if, if someone is actually, you know, really stoned at, at 55 or 60 Druid score, even their and their baseline really would be 40, they're not going to be able to learn the Druid app as well as if they were not stoned because cannabis interferes with learning, learning new behaviors and new information. So, so the, the, so their, their scores would not decline. So that in combination with the normative data, I think eventually will, or they'll start requiring people when they get their driver's license to do a Druid test, you know? Um, so, but, but, you know, Druid, I think eventually, or, you know, I mean, because drug tests are useless. They don't measure impairment. You know, cognitive motor impairment should be measured, I think, by measuring cognitive motor behaviors. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what, and that's what Druid does. Um, so it's a, it's a different way of uh, measuring how messed up you are, except for it. I'm sure there are people who are, I mean, maybe those people shouldn't have driver's licenses, who don't have, you know, good hand-eye coordination and can't do those tests. I suck at video games, but I'm a pretty good driver. <laughs> good. Well, you should try doing Druid and let me know. I, I think you would find it. Uh, I think you'd be able to learn it. I'll try. Actually, it'd be really funny if I just really do suck and I just can't get past, like, you know, <laughs> a normal score. Like 75. I'm just messed up. Well, you, you know, shapes appear on the screen. You have to, you know, you touch in a different place if it's a circle or a square kind of thing like that. You have to make a discrimination task or a circle is on the screen. You have to follow it around with your, with, with your finger. I mean, they're, they're really fairly simple tasks. If you focus on it uh, and you practice it a few times, it is, uh, it's actually, and I mean, as we've collected, uh, you know, a lot of data on it and actually maybe this might be a good time to show the slide if you could do that we the uh, I was able to obtain a small business innovation research grant from the uh, National Institutes of Health that funded research at Johns Hopkins Medical School and they uh, the that's okay they gave people they have their research participants come into the lab six different times and they uh, either uh, use a volcano vaporizer with, you know, uh, zero milligrams, five milligrams, or 20 milligrams of THC, or they ate a brownie with zero milligrams, 10 milligrams, or 25 milligrams of THC. And you could see, the, and then follow them over eight hours, and you could see that Druid is sensitive enough to distinguish different levels of impairment from different amounts of THC that a person consumes. So these scores are, you know, the, the same people, 
did each of these six conditions. So, you know, each person consumed zero milligrams of THC and then did Druid for eight hours. And then on another day did five milligrams. And on another day they did 20 milligrams. And these were the uh, results. I, when the, I had gone down to Baltimore to Johns Hopkins and they showed me this, these results and my heart started uh, kind of pounding because it, it's just, it's a pretty dramatic demonstration of the sensitivity that, that Druid has. So before I, I throw it to one of the other experts, I want to ask, like, is there anything that makes cannabis particularly challenging? Like, we, you can breathalyze people up here, you know, and, and so what, what, what makes cannabis challenging? Is there something individual that, that, that we need to create a, a whole new system of, of awareness? I mean, you, may, you, you laid it on pretty simply with we need to measure cognitive impairment when we're measuring cognitive impairments. Pretty fucking simple. Uh, but is there something different about cannabis that, that's apart from alcohol that makes it a little bit more challenging to understand? Well, well, you, you know, the, the, the physiological, neurological pathways of alcohol impairment and cannabis impairment are, are different, how, how the body responds to those two different um, substances. Uh, but the level of impairment uh, can be equivalent. Um, uh, although... Uh, one, one, so we, we have actually at, the, at this point three different uh, peer reviewed publications that, that validate Druid. Uh, and one uh, we did with um, it, uh, 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 Hollis Caroli and Cinnamon Bidwell, um, two big uh, cannabis researchers in um, Colorado. Uh, uh, they used um, uh, Druid uh, studying, uh, you know, daily, very frequent uh, uh, cannabis consumers. Uh, often medical patients, and I collected some data in Washington State as well. And uh, the the typical, I think, average high level of of cannabis at at, at the peak. We we had people come in and they consume their sort of regular amount and did druid for you know a couple hours. Uh, and their average level of government is about 50, 51, something like that. They weren't showing the level of impairment that you that we saw in at the uh, wet labs in uh, with alcohol uh, drinking and a high level of uh, blood alcohol. But we still were able to measure a level of impairment that would have made you know driving or operating heavy machinery uh, more dangerous, uh, more risky. So uh, on the same milligram basis, how does this compare with opiates? I would imagine you give the same dose of opiates that you're giving THC, these people are going to be way off the scale. So can you talk about that impairment, driving impairment under opiates? Oh, um, uh, we, I have not done any research on, on opiates. We did have a researcher who was going to use Druid uh, in a study of opiates uh, and then the pandemic hit. Uh, and so that's that study got uh, well. Do, do you trailed. really think that that stone drivers under the influence of marijuana are a problem in society today, or do you think that drivers who are under the influence of opiates are more of a hazard to society today? Oh, I would guess that someone on opiates would be a much greater risk. Um, I mean, that's the the you know the the epidemiological studies you know, kind of indicate that cannabis is far less dangerous than alcohol. Uh, absolutely, no question about it. And, you know, particularly because people can develop tolerance, well, to, to both substances, actually. I mean, that's, you know, that that's a kind of uh, myth that's sort of around. I've seen it, you know, written up by PhDs that at the 0.08 level of alcohol, virtually everyone is, is impaired. And that's not true. You know, talking to... Talking to pol police officers, you know, they, they would talk about these professional drinkers who would, you know, hang out in bars and practice doing the standard field sobriety test. So they would be able to pass it even though, and, you know, what, one officer was telling me they had pulled over a guy uh, and they had uh, he'd written him up. He had passed the standard field sobriety test. He was just writing something up. The, the guy was leaning against his car and then just kind of passed out and turned out his BAC was, you know, 0.4 or something. It's amazing. He wasn't dead. Uh, but, but he still passed the standard field sobriety test so that, uh, and one of the key things about Druid is that um, 
every time the presentation of the stimuli, the circles and the squares where they appear is different, is uh, random. Uh, so that there's no pattern that a person can learn. And I've, I've seen sort of other tools that purport to measure uh, impairment and they just do the same thing all the time, you know, that you can obviously learn and, and game the test. And that's not something you can do as anyway, as easily as, as uh, on Druid. So, but yeah, but certainly opioids would be a much greater risk. Uh, and, you know, and people can develop tolerance. And so, uh, so uh, their level of, of high, and I've actually seen this in my, uh, myself, if I'm, consuming, you know, kind of really daily, then my, my, the highest level that I get to with the, with the same amount uh, would be about a, you know, like my baseline is about 40, I might get a 45. Um, whereas if I, if I take a, you know, a couple weeks off, you know, my score can be like 60. Um, so um, uh, people who develop tolerance are, at much less risk <laughs> of, of having an accident or anything like that than, um, uh, and, and certainly I think in general, uh, less of a risk uh, than, in, than people who use alcohol. But, but actually at, at this point, it's often the, the, the poly drug use, you know, combination of, of alcohol, cannabis, something else. Uh, and, and that, and that's why, you know, drug testing is, is useless and you know the various different devices like that the hound labs breathalyzer um it, it you know measures kind of only cannabis you know it could be there are multiple sources of 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 impairment people of uh, fatigue uh you know uh illness uh injury concussion um uh that could be contributing to a person's impairment where if you just, you know, did a breathalyzer and a, a cannabis breathalyzer, that wouldn't necessarily show that this person is impaired. So that, that's why I think really sort of cognitive motor assessment is, is really, I think is the future of impairment testing. Yes. Oh man, You're up, is it me? <laughs> well, I'm just like soaking this all up. I think it's really cool. And it's really cool to think about your brain and how it's being influenced by, you know, a, one substance or multiple substances and how they may potentiate the risks. Um, and actually, it's really cool, too, that you've worked with uh, CU Boulder folks because they they have that cosmic study at CU. And I looked it up and it's the Cannabis Observational Study on Mood, Inflammation and Cognition. And they drive around in vans and people <laughs> smoke weed in their apartment. I know this because my husband, Derek, participated yeah. in the study. They'll smoke weed in their apartment. Well, before they do, they'll go down into the van and they'll do a bunch of these tests. And I'm assuming like he was saying that there's like motor, short term memory, like there's lots of different kind of cognitive tests that they do. And then, yep. then he'll go up and smoke weed and come back down to the van and has to do the tests again. So exactly. Like, yeah. I think that that's really, really cool and that you've partnered with them. And I'd like to know a little bit more about kind of what these tests are measuring, because there's lots of different ways your brain can be inhibited. Some may or may not affect your ability to drive or make like split second decisions or, you know, in an emergency when you're driving and things like that. And like, what kind of levels of cognition are you measuring? And then how does that translate into actual driving? Sure, sure. So, um, we, you know, after uh, Dr. Grinspoon had, had said, you should do that, you should develop um, that, that measure. I did what I've done for 40 years to, you know, do a deep dive in the, in the relevant literature for, for the, the driving impairment literature. Uh, and I, you know, I sort of picked that, you know, because actually at this point, you know, it, it's a real advantage, I think, for me. It turned out not to have been a cannabis scientist uh, for my career because I didn't learn all the standard tools that they used. I created my own. And so I, you know, dove into the literature and I identified the, uh, the behaviors that are important for driving that end up getting impaired by cannabis and alcohol. So uh, reaction time, um, 
hand-eye coordination, balance, you know, like, you know, a third to a half of the neurons in the brain are in the cerebellum, which control balance. And so if that's disrupted, you have pretty system-wide uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in impairment. Uh, so uh, uh, decision making. Uh, so we have a, a discrimination task. You have to, you know, a circle or a square flashes on the screen and you have to do something different depending upon what the shape was. Um, uh, and and the, there's four tasks in the, in the full app and the first three are, are called divided attention tasks where you have to do multiple things at the same time. So just like driving, you know, you have to, uh, you know, you're looking down the road, your rear view mirror, yelling at the kids in the back seat, whatever, you're doing multiple things um, uh, that could affect your reaction time and so on like that. So that for the, for the, um, for the, the, we have a time estimation task where so people have to, uh, 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 while they're, you know, estimating the passage of 30 seconds, they're having to uh, 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 tap uh, circles on the, on, on the screen uh, while they are um, uh, tracking the moving circle. They have to also count the squares that are flashing on the screen. Um, uh, you know, and often when I describe this app, um, people say, well, that sounds really challenging. And I'll say, well, so is driving. All right. Uh, so you need to be able to process a lot of information. And, uh, you know, your slowed reaction time is uh, that increases your risk of an accident. Uh, could be because, um, you know, some kid jumps out, you know, in, from in between two cars or something like that. You need to be able to respond quickly. And if your reaction time is slowed, that creates greater risk for injury or accident or so, something like that. So, so um, those are the range of different kind of cognitive motor behaviors that, um, that often regular cannabis researchers have a different task to measure, uh, you know, individual uh, things that there's a, you know, divided attention, a divided attention task that takes about 10 or 15 minutes for the person to do and so on like that. You know, one of the real advantages of Druid is that you can, since it only takes one minute, you can take it, repeat, you can consume or you can do it first and then consume and then do it multiple times. And you can see the Druid curve that goes up, reaches a peak and then starts going down again. And it's, um, call it the Druid curve. So anyway, um, it's kind of like Fitbit tracking your steps, but instead it's tracking how messed up you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you like, know, and can you upload this to the cloud and like trend data over time? Like, is that and and for like users who are pretty yeah. much daily users, like, can you compare like daily users to suppress like sporadic users and see like what that differential in 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 uh, like an ebriation is? I think that'd be really cool. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, and, and I mean, we, you know, the two of the studies where Druid has been used is comparing the Johns Hopkins study was uh, individuals who uh, uh, were infrequent users. One one subject hadn't even uh, consumed for you know a year or something like that. Whereas the, the Cinnamon Bidwell study was uh, of frequent users. And it, it's clear the average level of impairment, it was significantly lower for the, you know, the, the daily users. So, you know, that, that clearly, you know, is a demonstration of, of the development of, of tolerance. Um, now, uh, there was something else I was going to say, which I forget. Short-term memory last is one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> it also comes with with age. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. No, that's that's really really cool. So actually, you're I, way you're way behind me. I'm I'm going to be seventy. <laughs> I'm going to be seventy three this year. So anyway. well, at least in our scores, I'd match you. I'm sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Doctor. I see you have Michael. I, I don't have any questions. I'm just, um, I don't, this is so cool. <laughs> good, good, good. Okay. Okay. So oh. we're talking about ways the app could be used, and this might be a little out there to show that you're being inhibited, but are there ways that the app might show or could integrate cognitive functions that may be enhanced by cannabis? The, that that was actually out there? 
that was exactly <laughs> the, 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 the point that I, that I was uh, going to make that, you know, I called it impairment. That was a way to, to get attention from the people who, who have money. But, you know, my, my fantasy has always been if Drew had made it really big, I could start a foundation that would fund research on positive effects. You know, as, as an artist and a musician, you know, I've experienced the creativity enhancing effects. Yeah, of, I was going to say, like, would you measure the time of noodling? Like, would it be like a noodle off? Like, how much you can jam? <laughs> would that be part of the assessment? Well, it's got to be I, I, somewhere. That would be, you know, and I mean, there, there's research on on kind of brain injuries where, 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 where they know that, you know, once some capacities get disabled and that actually releases or activates other other potential uh, 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 positive effects. So it's it's you know, there, there's really a model for how that that could work. There just hasn't been, you know, the, the schedule one uh, designation for cannabis has just inhibited all this. I mean, I, you know, the you know, they you know, NIDA has really been the scientific arm of the war on drugs. And it's just, you know, funded, you know, if, if you thought of a harm that cannabis could do, they'll just be throwing money at you, you know. Now, they, they are changing, I think, now as, as it, you know, societal attitudes toward cannabis are, are changing. Uh, but there's still a big need for research on that, which I would love to do. But first things first, you know. You know, it's an interesting subject, and, and one of the biggest things, like, I'm just watching the chat just go nuts, because it, it, it's quite funny, because, you know, we have a lot of high consumers on our channel, a lot of a lot of high consumer followers, and, you know, I think this is an important subject to dig into, because it's not just about, you know, how, it, it's your, it's more about state of mind than what, what it is that you've consumed, because I've had moments in time where I've been completely like lack there of focus, not being able to understand, like, like made major driving errors and made major, major challenges for myself because of my state of mind, right? Mm -hmm. That can greatly affect your focus and straight. And whether, you know, if you're a daily consumer or not, it, it, if you have a baseline and understanding where that is, it, it could really be a safety net for some of us. I mean, because um, what, what we have right now is in, in Canada is an arbitrary number that's put forward through testing. David, do you know a little bit more about the, the testing regulations in Canada so you can break that down for a little bit better? Um, yeah, I do. Uh, depends where you really want to start. Uh, criminally, so like at the federal level, uh, anything above five nanograms per milliliter is considered a less severe offense. Uh, above that, you can end up going to jail. Um, what's happening is at the provincial level, or the state level, there's just administrative fees for failing a roadside like swab test. It can cost upwards of three thousand dollars, and oh, there's no there's no criminal charge to it. Um, when the laws were written, uh, you know, no offense, you know, the guy, I, I kind of do feel like Health Canada is getting to the mark, but that's a side point. Um, they did the best with what was available, which was very little information. Like they had the 1997 Kelly study that they could go by. But a lot of the data and a lot of the information that built this was collected under scenarios where uh, people weren't very relaxed um so late last year early this year a uh, doctoral candidate from university of british columbia michelle saint pierre uh, she released a study and it kind of shows that like in a natural setting for you know somebody that uses cannabis medically and like regularly as a medical user, um, there's no impairment, right? So from a construction side point with the Druid app, I like it. It's a nice tool to kind of like uh, maybe take some of the burden off of a supervisor. But at that same point, like in Canada on construction sites, 
uh, it's the construction site owner's sandbox. Uh, they're allowed to make the rules. So there's pre-access, post-incident. And that is all like, if you're somebody that uses cannabis three times a week uh, and a really high metabolism, it's about four to five weeks before you're able to pass the drug test to get onto those sites, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, as we get going here with federal legalization in Canada, we're going to see a lot more uh, studies and stuff came come out. But this one from Michelle St. Pierre kind of like confirms what people have been saying that are, you know, medical users are using it that three, four times a, a week. And uh, they, you just know you're not going to pass that drug test just because of how they're testing for THCA and, you know, pres with cannabis. It's not, not a level testing for THCA. In, in the urine? No, they test for the hydroxy metabolites and they test for THC. So when you test, when you take a urine test or you take a blood test, they're usually looking for <clears throat> something called 11 hydroxy THC. They're yeah, not that's for Yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, okay. Um, I'll, send, I'll send you what we have and uh, like what the urinalysis and stuff goes by. Um, so the problem is, is what's being tested for up here is the metabolite. It's not measuring a level of impairment, right? So, you know, it, it's unfortunate because like late, mid 1800s, uh, there's lots of people that were turning around and saying, you know, cannabis is wonderful. It doesn't do any of these horrible things. And then like the early 1900s happened, right? So, but we're coming out of it. Yeah. Awesome. So I think what we're going to do is take a little momentary break because we're at the 45 minute mark and we're going to hop into that. We're going to come back with, with some more questions and stuff. So get them in there. I've been saving them as we go. And like I said, I, you know, it's kind of fun. We got a few people to do the Druid app while they're in the show at the start of the show. And we're going to get them to do it at the end and let us know what the score is because we're hoping that everybody is consuming ample amounts during the show as a general goal <laughs> to dang hour uh, to have, have, have some dang conversations and, and enjoy some dang so, so we'll be right back after a quick momentary uh, break. See you all in a moment.
So I got a big one for you here, and and I think this is this is something that's been stewing in my mind, and it's one of the problems that we see in society and in most things, and and what happens is we create a system or a method of measurement, and it's often taken advantage of in in, in a way that we we don't typically understand. Now now my understanding is is maybe a little bit different, but how, how can, how could the Druid, like, can the Druid app be taken advantage of? Can, or could this be maybe perhaps a tool or a defense line for people that are regular consumers that actually perform better when they're, when they're under the influence, whereas, well, you know, like a smell swab or a urine test isn't going to, is not going to protect these people? Um, yes. The, um, you know, the, one of my um, thoughts has been that Druid can provide, Yeah, you know, I mean, the thing with the standard field sobriety test and the whole DRE, drug recognition expert, you know, two hour program is that it's all subjective. Uh, you know, it's the, you know, the police officers are trained to make judgments and so on like that, but still it's subjective. Um, and so having an objective, uh, empirical measure of impairment, I think is a great advance. And so my, um, you know, belief is that Druid is going to be able to provide an affirmative defense. If, you know, some law enforcement person pulls you over and says, I think you're impaired, you know, I, you know, medical cannabis patients and so on are going to be able to do Druid and say, I'm not impaired. Look at this. Um, you know, and what's the law enforcement officer going to do to, you know, deny that, that, you know, that actual data. So um, I think it, it, it is going to be able to be used in, in a, in a real positive way, you know, for, for medical cannabis patients who, who certainly at the initial stage, when they're trying to figure out what, what dosage is going to work the best, you know, I think Druid can be used to, to locate the, you know, the dosage that provides the most, um, symptom relief with the least impairment, for example, you know, so, um, you know, I think there are a lot of different, well, and, and actually I should note, um, uh, you know, being of the older persuasion, um, that we are, we're very close to, uh, getting a grant from the National Institute of Aging to, uh, uh, do research recruiting, you know, seniors age, you know, 65 to 85 and, uh, to have them do Druid and use the driving simulator that's out at UMass Amherst. Um, Cause I think Druid can be a really useful tool for, to promote healthy aging, to give people information about, you know, sometimes it looks good for driving. Sometimes it doesn't, and they should be aware that this is going to allow people to be able to test themselves, to, to have information about themselves, to make, you know, appropriate and responsible decisions. They're all always going to be people who make irresponsible decisions, but anyone, I think the, you know, the vast majority of people want to be responsible, but the most they could say was, gee, are you okay to drive? And they could say, yeah, I think so. Um, how about having an actual measure of that? And, you know, I've, I know I was experienced this, you know, early on, I was at, you know, a meeting with some, with some people and we were getting stoned, uh, talking about Druid. Uh, and then it was time to leave and I thought I'd do Druid and, you know, my score indicated I should not drive at that moment. And so, you know, I waited another hour or so and then, um, was able to make it home safely. Um, but so I, I just, you know, I, I mean, I was all excited. I mean, I, obviously I like data and graphs and computer analysis and so on like that. Uh, and I was just all excited to have a tool that you could measure how stoned you were. And some of the, the biggest pushback I got early, one of the things I started early on, it was, you know, uh, just me doing everything in the business. Uh, and uh, one of the things I did was a Google news search every morning for marijuana, cannabis and driving. And then, you know, posting comments on articles, you know, when they say there's no way to measure impairment, I'd say, oh, but there is and so on like that. And then and I had I had um, regular consumers, you know, kind of arguing with me saying, you know, I'm I don't get impaired at all and everything like that. And I'd say, well, would you do the app and and see and so on like that. Uh, and I just remember one comment. Um, 
you know, I thought I was creating something really good for, for regular cannabis users. And the comment was, blow me, narc boy, and which was later deleted. Uh, but, you know, that was, you know, and I, I am so, you know, I'm, I'm very pro cannabis. I'm anti impaired driving, uh, you know, so um, uh, that was, this individual was really missing the point of the app, I thought. Just before we go on, London, you make a good point, Dr. Milburn. Uh, impaired driving, nobody should drive impaired. I, I agree with you on that. Um, <clears throat> having said that, we know scientifically, based on body weight and alcohol content, how much we can have before we get behind the wheel. And that, that, that science is down pat, right? You don't even really need a breathalyzer. That's why w when you go through a stop check, when did you have your last drink, right? Mm. With cannabis, they don't, they don't know, right? It's they have no, they have no clue. Yeah. It, I, I like the good old days when law enforcement was able to use their judgment. Um, <clears throat> law enforcement likes having the tools now. But there's always that stop check of a uh, drug recognition expert. But that doesn't mean you're not getting the $3,000 in fines for failing. Not fines, total cost, $3,000 mm -hmm. just for that roadside whatever. So, yeah. 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 Well, the, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the evidence, the, the research is very clear that per se levels, you know, four or five, you know, uh, nanograms per milliliter or something you know clearly just doesn't measure impairment and uh i there's a there's a few states that that do have it uh you know early states washington and and colorado uh have kind of you know per se levels of of, uh, of thc metabolite levels but more recently legalizing states like michigan they actually had a you probably heard about this they know they had a a panel that recommended against setting any limit because that's what the science clearly says, you know, so that they, so Michigan doesn't have a limit like that. They just say you shouldn't be impaired. Um, but they don't really kind of, I, I mean, you know, and the standard field sobriety test research shows doesn't really pick up impairment from cannabis. Uh, so, you know, th there really needs to be a tool to, to do that. And, you know, I obviously, the broken record, I think Druid could actually be that tool. Well, and I think that you're bringing up a really good point too, and that impairment is kind of multi-layered. It's not just a urine test or a blood test or a breath breathalyzer because that doesn't get the big picture. And if you really want the measurable outcome to be as similar to the process you're really trying to test them for, which is their ability to operate a vehicle safely, or at least within normal reaction times and uh, making like good decisions and things like that. Like you should, you should really be measuring this outcome instead of all these other inputs, which maybe would build a bigger picture. Like maybe there are certain interactions that some people with some metabolisms might have when they drink alcohol and have another drug in their system. I mean, we do know that these drugs interact with each other and they may both be below some acceptable limit, but it's going to impair you, you know? So but I think that it, it, yeah, yeah. When you bring them together, exactly. And so I think that it, what this does is it opens up discussion for what is impairment and, and, and if you really want to protect people, which is what all of us want, right? Because all of us have seen, I definitely have seen drunk drivers out there. I even like, yeah, I, I may have like chased one down once and like kept, kept recording them, like, like the hoping the cops would come because they were putting people at risk. But like, um, yeah, yeah, whoops. <laughs> but I mean, I was being a vigilante, you know, but uh mm. There's like definitely people out there who drive impaired. And, and I also wanted, okay, this is another question that I had. When people take these tests, you know, they have their score, but there's also, I'm sure, a perceived 
notion of what they may like how they may have done. I'm really curious to see if like when you drink and you perform poorly versus when you smoke weed or, or have an edible and you perform poorly. If at the end of that test, you think you nail it when you're drunk, you're like, yeah, I totally nailed that test. Uh, while when you're high, you're a little bit more cognizant of the fact that you are impaired. Because I think that that's one thing, too, that you, I don't know, maybe maybe other people don't feel this way. You kind, you know you're impaired if you are impaired when you're high. But when you're drunk, I feel like you don't always have that self-recognition. Although, actually, uh, Ashley Brooks Russell uh, and... Um, uh, did some research at uh, University of Iowa. They have a big driving simulator study. And actually what they found was that uh, people with cannabis uh, underestimated uh, how impaired they were. You know, and I think the real, the real danger point, as I said, there's, you know, the druid curve as impairment goes up and then it goes down. I think most people know when they're, you know, when they reach the top of that curve, I shouldn't be driving. But then, you know, you wait about, you know, 15, 20 minutes and half an hour, the impairment's going down. They know they are lower than that high point where they were. And so they, they're going to be less aware of, of, of their impairment. And that's what, that's what uh, Ashley Brooks Russell found in that. So, but again, there's going to be, there's going to be individual, you know, differences in, in how perceptive people are about what their, what their level of, of, of impairment is. I mean, I know, I mean, I've done Druid a lot um, and I can often tell, anticipate within a point, you know, what my Druid score is going to be based on, on, on how I feel, you know, and I think that's an important thing to do. You know, the, the more people use Druid and it's, you know, it's in the app store and Google play, uh, the more precise the measurement be becomes that, you know, we've done, you know, repeated testing, you know, like two tests in a row or three tests in a row and look at the, the difference in the tests um, as a measure of the reliability. And, you know, the average difference that we're finding is like less than a point um, when, when people do, you know, m multiple tests. So, um, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a really good, really good tool. But, but, you know, we're, we're never, we certainly do not advocate, you know, locking someone up if they fail the dru Druid test. You know, Druid is just an additional piece of information. It's an additional tool that people can use to, to as assess impairment that should be combined with, you know, people's perceptions. Is he acting strange? You know, whatever uh, other information is, is, is available. But, you know, it, it does provide objective information that I think can be really valuable. Yeah, I can't explain that. Um, I'm just looking at the document that um, that Damon had sent. Um, I guess I'm the not a doctor. <laughs> furnaces at the United States government are really burning very hard on this one, right? You know how? Why are you testing for THCA when you consume it? There is no THCA, so con testing the urine for THCA is just completely uninformed well right? you're right the body does turn it into 11 hydroxy when you eat it as an edible that's why it's like 10 15 no you at, at the nail at your chaz nail that you're giving me shit for <laughs> that's where you're turning the thca and the thc right yeah correct one way trip there's no yep. there's yep. no reversibility so when like, you're with inhaling an edible. through the rig or when you're inhaling a joint you're not you're not consuming thca right no no uh, with an edible though thc that's well where, if you your know, edibles like are comes if in. your edibles are gummies and they're made at the uh, temperature of boiling sugar which is 260 fahrenheit there's no way that what? a cannabinoid acid is going to survive that right the only time you're going to get THCA is when you're consuming raw cannabis, either in juice or just eating eating flour. I'm going to ask one of the labs I deal with just why it's like that, because they have to have their reason. And it's been like this for like 15 years. 
Wait a second. Uh, <laughs> Dude, this is coming from the United States fucking government. You yeah. think they got cannabis right? Come on, man. They Everything That's they've hard. done on cannabis <laughs> has been absolutely wrong. The That's fact hard. that there are four FDA-approved drugs, right, with phytocannabinoids in them, yet the plant itself remains Schedule One, which by definition has no medical value whatsoever. It's a shit show. Hey, it's a scam. Um, a document that came in sent from Canada, not USDA or no US. No, 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 no. He the said, first one was Canada. Yeah, the first uh, one yeah. sent him that we and then we we just adopted. Uh, they adopted it from the United it. States. Yeah, substance abuse federal volume. Yeah, disease, I'm pretty sure, something. Damon, that that should be 11 hydroxy THC since they're talking about urine metabolites and metabolites that are in the body. 11 hydroxy is the first pass metabolite. That's the one that gets it, right? Yeah. So, and and 11 hydroxy is then converted onto something called norcarboxy. And then the next one that gets converted is water soluble, and that goes out with the urine, which is the gluconeride of, uh, of norcarboxy. But yeah, the people who wrote this document um, are not smart, they work for the US government. We're not subject matter. The question then. Tell us how you're really. The question then. <laughs> can can you can you like so there's a bunch of court cases right now probably out there where people have been you know put in jail over this. If if they can't even get the fucking science right, then then do they people even have validation? Wait a second, man. You guys, <laughs> I, I guess at work lose their job. People are selling high THCA cannabis under the flag that it's industrial hemp. Me and Anna have to deal with this every freaking day on LinkedIn. These high THC hemp hustlers, where it's, it's high THCA, I'm sorry, where they're saying, oh, but it, it's it's farm bill legal because it has less than 0.3% THC. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the this is the, the show that we live in. Welcome to the United Hopefully. States. Hopefully we can cut through a good portion of it. So this could... Stories. So to go back kind of on, on the draw there, I mean, you mentioned something, Dr. Mark, earlier that I thought was pretty critical and that, that we needed to dig into is like the opiate, opiates and the other other things. Because there's people, you know, like that are taking large amounts of Ritalin on a daily basis to, you know, taking taking all sorts of other things. Like maybe even, you know, I think it was even mentioned in the chat, like what about people that drink a shit ton of coffee every day and then take a day without coffee? You know, like are these... Like I find this interesting because we can we can look at measure of impairment on like I, I know if I don't drink coffee for like a day or two that I'm totally wonked in my my level of of awareness and what I'm able to get done in function aren't very good. <laughs> you know, is it, are these things that we've tested that you've tested to play with as well, or are there other avenues that we, that we're still kind of exploring with an app like this? Well, they're they're polyphenols and they're active, right? So they probably have some influence on uh the dopamine reward system in your brain so we all feel good when we drink that first sip of coffee and maybe mike has actually some clinical relevant data to share here but what i would say is that anything that can affect your mood could essentially put put you in, in into that but maybe there's a more scientific basis right mike <laughs> well we we did collect a, a little data um uh uh, having a uh, uh, one of our participants, you know, uh, drink wine, and we could see impairment going up and going down, and then drinking wine and combining it with caffeine, uh, and actually the, the, the Druid scores did not improve with the caffeine. Still saw the the same level of impairment, you know from from alcohol going up and then going down and in fact the the wine and the the caffeine together was actually a little bit worse <laughs> than the just wine and so on like that so you know certainly and i think people sort of know that that coffee doesn't sober you up it just makes you a more awake drunk um so uh but we ha we haven't <laughs> we we haven't tested whether people uh, you know, are, when they're going through caffeine withdrawal, how that affects their performance. But that's a, yeah, that's the thing about science. There's always another study to do. There's always a million studies. But Mike, do. couldn't it be? Could it like Tess was talking about coffee, and certainly like if you just 
broke up with your girlfriend or there's lots of things that affect your 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 impairment or not impairment your cognitive ability well right yeah yeah and, and actually re research shows that um uh people who are anxious or depressed have slower reaction times you know that 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 certainly you know mental health issues can impact a person's cognitive motor performance as well as substance or so on like that. So, I mean, there's a lot, you know, you maybe have a, a new baby who's kept you up all night and you show up on the construction site. Uh, uh, you can be really impaired even though you haven't, you know, had anything, any impairing substance. Um, so um, uh, anyway. Um, well, and what, what I was thinking just in terms of coffee, I mean, I, I have that cup of coffee in the morning and i'm just like you london i'm not the same if i like if something takes me out of my routine and i skip that cup of coffee i i feel like i, I have a different day right <laughs> yeah. so could couldn't there be some other reward center in the brain that is either not nourished properly or that somehow affects your cognitive ability behind the wheel um Certainly, certainly possible. Um, I, I couldn't name any of those, <laughs> uh, but uh, you, you know, and and Druid, you know, measures as I as I determine sort of some of the most important cognitive motor behaviors that get impaired by by cannabis. That research has shown that uh, you know cannabis and alcohol both uh, you know impair performance on, um, but there certainly could be could be more. You know some different aspects that Druid isn't picking up, uh, but that's why you know Druid is also, you know, we've continued to collect data and improve the the test. There was sort of Druid 1.0 that that Johns Hopkins tested, and since then we have you know increased the reliability by you know adding some different variables to the mix and so on like that. Uh, increase the the reliability and the the precision of the of the app. So it's a it's it's an evolving tool that you know my goal is is to continue to you know improve and you know if a, additional areas are identified that you know we should be measuring we can always you know include those um, so we're always on the on the lookout for that. Awesome. We're getting close to the end of the episode. I've seen lots of activity in the chat, so I assume people um, have have a few questions to come on. Um, is there like you said? We saw the bell curve for cannabis, but like, did did we see something similar in in alcohol or the, the alcohol studies that you did that you, you mentioned a little bit with the wine? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, at, at the alcohol, the curve goes up and goes down. Uh, at, at one point, I, I got a breathalyzer, a backtrack breathalyzer, and did alcohol myself getting uh, my BAC. I got it up to about 0.09, and I just felt physically ill. I never want to, you know, have that much alcohol again. But I, I tested my BAC. I did Druid, and the correlation, you know, the, on the, as you're drinking and the alcohol is building up in your system, the breathalyzers are less accurate. Uh, uh, but on the on the down slope, it's it's they're they're quite consistent uh, as long as you're not continuing to drink. Um, and the correlation between the Druid scores that I that I co uh, collected and the um, the blood BAC levels was 0.89. And correlations run from you know zero to one. Uh, and my dad, who was a, a psychology professor. Um, I wasn't very creative in my career choice, obviously. Um, uh, uh, always said, you know, if you get a correlation of 0.9, uh, you're just measuring the same thing twice. So I was, I was very excited at that, you know, and and actually fr from an early point uh, in in my thinking, I, you know, I realized if you just come up with a number, people don't know what that is. So we were able to calibrate it against blood alcohol concentration levels, because uh, people generally have a sort of a concept, oh yeah, 0 0.05, 0 0.08, you know, they have some kind of understanding, yeah, that's that's bad and that's worse. Uh, and to develop the equivalent 
impairment levels uh, that that people to you know to BAC levels. That's one of the things that the app gives you is a sort of a an absolute level of how impaired you are, and then a sort of a personal level comparing to your baseline. So we we try to provide a lot of information. So I, I kind of have a, have a, have a big rundown. Is I'd like to know just because you have we have a you kind of started this this idea with you know Dr. Grinspoon in a, an interesting conversation point and pushing it forward there. And now you're up to this point now where you've collected a bunch of data and you're still collecting data and trying to get into it a little bit further. How do you see the Druid app developing over the years? And what are the what are the steps you're currently taking to advance the technology and move it forward? In, in, in the way that you believe will be best. Okay. Well, as as you say, we're continuing to do studies. We're we're setting up a a, a fatigue study, uh, 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 where we're going to get people to stay up for twenty four hours and then to you know do a druid to see how that um, uh, impacts uh, their their performance. We've actually uh, worked with some public safety, you know, firefighting, EMT. Uh, departments uh, in uh, uh, Texas who, you know, they're on a schedule like 48 hours on and 96 hours off or 24 hours on and 48 hours off. And, you know, what it's so the, uh, uh, Highland Park, Texas came to us and said, you know, we're thinking about making a shift change. Can you help us? And so we collected data on the 24 hour on 48 hour off and then uh, found that a, you know, a small group of people that they had do a different shift um, do a 48 hours off, you know, two days on, four days off, uh, did that and their scores improved. Uh, they came back more rested at the start of their 48 hour shift than people did when they came to start their 24 hour shift. So then they actually shifted uh, the whole department to a you know, 48 hour on, 96 hour off and their and then when they took Druid at the start of, of their, their, their shift, uh, their scores were better. You know, they were getting able to get more rest in their off days than they, in, you know, and, and so that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of information that, that Druid could, can, can provide. And so we're, we're, you know, looking at sort of specific studies to uh, uh, measure that. We're, we're actually uh, also, I mean, at, at this point, uh, it's possible to cheat on on the test. Uh, you know, when you're supposed to stand on one better than if you do it on, on one leg. And so we're actually, what we're doing is developing ways to, uh, uh, we have a great uh, data scientist, uh, uh, PhD, who joined our team, uh, and we're developing ways to sort of look at the accelerometer data and the, the motion data that separates out um, uh, people who are, you know, really good in in balance uh, versus not, um, uh, to to see how that affects the scores. Um, so we're, you know, we're all the time we're we're collecting new data, um, and we're eventually going to be able to, uh, you know, have a tool where that that will be able to determine whether people are are cheating or not. I mean. At, at, at this point, which in construction sites, people show up and they do the test and then go, you know, uh, start their work day. Uh, those are generally sort of supervised um, situations. And so Druid can work fine there. Ultimately, in the next six months to a year, we'll have, you know, additional sort of uh, anti-cheat features that we're going to add as well. So, um, but, you know, I, when I created Druid, um, I really saw it as a, as a, person, a personal use tool to give you information about, you know, what your own level was and uh, of, of cognitive motor performance or impairment. And, and you know, early on, the, the first few months, yeah, you know, uh, I was just working all the time on it. And, and my wife came out and said, you know, well, what's going on here? You're obsessed with this. You're just working on this all the time. What's going on? And I sort of thought, oh, wow, she's right. And I sort of reflected on that. And what came to mind was back when I was, you know, 12 or 13, I was a Boy Scout. And uh, every month we got Boy's Life magazine. Um, 
uh, for, and uh, the scouting magazine and in every uh, issue was a six or eight panel cartoon strip of some boy scout doing something heroic saving people from a burning building and i always wanted to be that that boy scout and i never got to be um but then i realized if my app persuades people to delay driving or not drive if they're impaired i've potentially saved their life the lives of the people in the car with them on the road around them and so this has been you know something that's can be really emotionally important for me to really advance and it's really been about safety and creating a community of safety whether in the on the construction side or in the in the um, on the road you know and so um, I'm really sort of committed to this enterprise I love that comment in the past I, remember. I was kicked out of Boy Scouts for smoking weed um, <laughs> I cannot all lie <laughs> most honest boy scout but, there, you, but. You, you know one of the memories i have yeah i was kicked out for smoking weed but i remember you know having to carry cases of beer for the parents mm. <laughs> for the fathers <laughs> who went on camping trips for us so while we were off smoking weed the boy scouts the fathers were all sitting around the fire drinking budweiser and michelob <laughs> Oh my! See, this is this is an area like I, when I when I kind of read into Drew it app and how, how the cognitive you know testing could be could be used. Like I like I, I've mentioned before, I think it's it, it could play an advantage for medical patients, right? That they're using every single day and don't have to worry about the nanograms of, of blah 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 in their system because they they need it you know it's like it's it's like some of these people it's like their cup of coffee without it they're just not going to function as human beings and we need to be able to enable these people into the roles and responsibilities and jobs of every regular day person right like this is the kind of the goal of of cannabis as medicine in our thoughts. So I think what you're doing is really highly valuable, not only in the way that we can prevent, you know, an injury, a death from occurring, but we can enable people that, that need to be in the workforce that want to be in the workforce to be in the workforce or to do what they need to do and, and be able to prove that they're cognitively, cognitively there and aware. It's, it's highly important, especially as we get into such a diverse and dynamic subject such as having fully legal cannabis everywhere right it's all says every there's a lot more people consuming and you know there's a lot of people i know that i don't want to see smoke a doobie and drive a car just straight up it is like my, my sisters my 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 brothers my i'm probably the only one in my family that can consume like i do and, and do what i do but it, 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 it i think it's important to be, be to be checking out these things and understanding where we can move forward because there's there's a lot of fun that's that's involved there now we are rounded out to the hour and a half point does anybody have any final questions for our guests today from the panel well there, there was that question about adderall um and you know that 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 question really highlights the the bias against cannabis is that you have all these medications to say oh don't drive or operate heavy machinery after taking this uh but there's no you know benadryl test or something like that you know for the roadside something like that so again there are so many potentially impairing substances and medications, all of which should be assessed in terms of how impaired the person is or not. Or fatigue. And fatigue. Or fatigue. Absol right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I would um, imagine fatigue is responsible for more automobile accidents than cannabis. And this would be great if this druid thing could somehow be used in a non weed way to make roads safer. And yeah. I just think about the truck driver who drives 22 hours a day, who probably should only be on that road for Can we know, use 10 it? or 15 hours. Could we use it to call into work like, oh, hey, boss, I'm really fatigued. And Druid says I'm too impaired to drive. Just get to work from a home today, okay? <laughs> well, you know, it, it's relatively easy to get a high score. You know, you just have to wave the device around. Uh, and and that'll get you to fail, you know. Uh, but if it, but if, if you do it conscientiously, it's really hard to get. And you know, don't cheat. It's hard to get a score lower than what your actual baseline is. Um, I was really surprised that I got a forty-three because I'm not good at video games. Like I get really flustered work. and I'm like, 
<laughs> and I kind of felt like that doing the Druid thing, but I was really surprised. 43 is a pretty good score, I thought. Well, you, you have the, you have the same baseline as a seventy year old man. <laughs> you can't cheat it either, <laughs> as it turns out. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Stoners usually do good at video games. <laughs> I've always been terrible at them. <laughs> last, last but not least, as we're rounding out to the hour and a half, you know how we always like to end these shows is is asking our special guests. First of all, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today on this very controversial subject that that. You know, it's, it's, I, I just had a lot of joy making the title episode and, and then just the woman with her head out the door with a giant <laughs> doobie. I just thought it was very entertaining for me to to throw right. that out there. Um, but I, I wanted to, you know, like what a what can we do to support you and, and where can we find your information and follow you to get more details on what what it is you do and follow along for those that want to. Okay, well, um, you know, check out the Im Impairment Science uh, website, www.impairmentscience.com. Um, it was a good place to start. Um, uh, you know, if people had questions, my email is mike at druidapp, all right, D -U -D -R -U -I -D -A -P -P .com. Um, uh, we have We have actually the uh, the peer-reviewed papers that you can download uh, uh, from the website if you'd like more information on how the app performs and tests that have been done and what the what our you know kind of future goals are and so on like that. But just kind of letting people know about about Druid and the the availability of it and the the I think the benefits that it um, can confer would be would be super helpful. again for joining us and and you know we'll have to have you back again in, in a year or so and, and see how the data is running and see what what new and interesting things are saying because it's got to be fun to put old people behind a wheel and then tell them you probably shouldn't be driving anymore you know, like that's got to be a little bit fun you know there's got to be some good, good stories involved with that one as well um but thank you again and i look forward to to, to having this conversation again. great great uh, thank you my, my pleasure is a lot of fun. Yeah, I got a, I got a credit scene. <laughs>